Well, now we are a little bit refreshed. I would like to hear more about individual careers of people here and why you made the choices you did in your career and just what you'd like to tell us. And I'd like to hear from you, Ernie, first. How we came to be a, a lawyer or? Uh, and, and what you did after you were a lawyer and how it went from there. Well, I, st I started off with, actually, when I left uh, Osgoode, I didn't have a job. I went back uh, to the hometown. I knew I didn't want to stay in Toronto. <laughs> that was number one. <laughs> and uh, then uh, one of the uh, small firms, uh, he was a veteran, been out uh, about 10 years, and he, uh, he hired me on. Who was that? Uh, Ab Klein. His son is uh, now a provincial judge up in Perry Sound. Uh, and uh, I stayed with them for two and a half years and then decided to go on my own, which I always wanted to do. And uh, then I got together with uh, another, uh, uh, Mike Bolin, about five years later, who became a judge as well. And uh, so I, I got involved in the community, and uh, we all did. All, all the lawyers did. You know, where they uh, joined service clubs, uh, you, uh, you know stuff like that. And you were involved with the Children's Aid, if I remember. Yeah, I was, yeah. I was uh, president of the Children's Aid for a while. Those are the tough years where you had to raise m a lot of the money yourselves, mm -hmm. too. And now it's all uh, provincially funded. And can, yeah, was that, that, was, Ab, that was one of Ab them. Klein? Ab Klein. Abraham Klein, K-L-E-I-N? Yeah, no, it just, no, Albert. It was Albert Klein, K-L-E-I-N, I think. What, can I ask you why you didn't practice with your brother? Because we got along well, <laughs> and I knew we wouldn't if we were together. And, and he uh, he had articled with the pra well, we articled in different firms up uh, up in North Bay, and he went back to his old firm, and uh, and hmm. I didn't. That's all. Yeah. When you were here going to school, where were you living? Uh, when well my uh, my undergrad, I was in residence one year, and then my mother moved down. Uh, she was alone. And she moved down for about three years, and then uh, and where else? I think I stayed in residence at the university uh, when I was at Osgoode one year. And <coughs> you never considered staying in Toronto? <laughs> never. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Anything else you'd like to talk about? What sure. about your years on the bench? Uh a good year. I was in Perry Sound, which is, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I did a lot of traveling around because uh, it wasn't that busy, and I, did, I uh, didn't mind working, and uh, so I did a lot of traveling, and uh, and ended up going to Newmarket for quite. A, I've spent a lot of my oh. time in Newmarket mm -hmm. in the last few years, but uh, <coughs> but when I went so I moved back to North Bay, and that's where I live. <laughs> and you have uh, the younger generation of the Lucadellas family is involved in the law too, right? Well, my daughter, who was uh, here at uh, you know, with the Law Society, and and my brother had three uh, three children. They're all uh, all lawyers. Uh, and one's the uh, deputy uh, deputy attorney general, I guess, in BC, and uh, one's in Hamilton, and the daughter's here. Not bad. Uh, I think I, I mentioned to uh, you and Constant at the beginning of my two things my father didn't want us to do, go into law or, or the restaurant business. So, <laughs> so we didn't go in the restaurant business anyway. You were half obedient. <laughs> and Ash, what about you? We, we talked about your years in private practice, but that's not what you're doing now. So how did you get from there to here and why? Um, I uh, loved private practice, um, but I was a part-time member of the Liquor License Board, and um, the uh, chair of the day offered me the opportunity to go full-time as vice chair in charge of the adjudication processes. And um, so I spoke to my partners and um, agreed that I would take a short leave of absence. <laughs> In fact, I think we may have kept the name on the letterhead at the time, I can't remember, but I had every intention of going back. 
But uh, then public law captured me. And um, shortly after that, um, the uh, chair and CEO of the Liquor License Board uh, took another job, and I went in acting. And um, it was, uh, it, it took them a while to find the replacement. And by the time um, some time had passed, they realized that I was doing an okay job. So I think I was the first person under 60 to be the chair, <laughs> first woman, <laughs> and first younger person to be the chair and CEO of the Liquor License Board. But you know, it's interesting because the, the Greek background and the restaurant background was a huge asset there. I really? mean, I remember yeah. just walking, one of the first days when, when I heard they were doing these information sessions from 12 to 2 on Friday the restaurant owners and I was just <laughs> aghast I thought, but that's their busiest time why would you ever do information well what's wrong with you know that's lunch time. so <laughs> it <laughs> that is really interesting I mean everybody around this table realizes that <laughs> yes, that's you know but yes. it's just the restaurant background and anyway so it did I, I think that it was uh, um, for me I understood the business I understood the culture things that might look irregular to a liquor inspector, I totally understood because it was just the way they did things. Um, and things that liquor inspectors did that they thought was okay was irregular to me because of my background in the restaurant uh, business. So it, my, my Greek heritage certainly uh, was a huge asset uh, in that particular job. And from there, I just stayed in public practice. My uh, partners uh, decided that I wasn't ever going back and uh, I think at some point I had to agree with them. And from there I went to be, again, none of this was planned, it all just happened, and they were just opportunities that arose that were too good to say no to. And uh, I was offered the position of uh, Secretary of Native Affairs. And again, Rhea and I were just chatting about this. Um, there was, for me, there was just an instant um, spark, uh, an instant um, understanding from of the cultural imperative for the Aboriginal people and why language was important and why culture was important. And it was just, uh, it, it was immediate. And uh, I, I loved that job as well. Um, and then as opportunity, and then I was made uh, Deputy Attorney General again. It was just one of those things. I was acting when the deputy left, acting for six months, and then they asked me to stay on. And so I did. And um, possibly my favorite job, uh, really? yeah, Deputy Attorney General. And uh, then I became uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, and once you leave Cabinet Secretary, you really can't go back into the public service. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky to be a judge. And uh, I've, you know, I, I seven years, seven and a half years on the Superior Court bench, and uh, uh, six months on the Court of Appeal. But uh, I think the Greek background, the Greek values, the Greek heritage um, is very compatible with public law. I, I'm not quite sure what it is, but I think it's that being involved in the community. I mean, I was never involved in community, in the Greek community, uh, other than the Hellenic Lawyers Association, but I was chair of the board in, uh, on the Y uh, in, in Toronto for a long time and involved in various other charitable organizations, so, but it wasn't in the Greek community, it was in other communities, as Ernie said. Why do you say that Deputy Attorney General was your favorite job so far? Oh, well, you know what, I, I love being a judge, so I, of, of uh, up until that point oh, right. in yes. time, um, uh, it, why? It had the full range of justice issues, it included on the ground justice services. Uh, there were a thousand lawyers, more than half of them <coughs> the Crown Attorney, you know, on the criminal side, and the other half um, doing other civil and um, non-criminal matters. The whole range of policy, because we had to comment on policy for the entire government. Um, you oversaw the administration of justice, so that was the relationship of the uh, executive to the judiciary as a separate branch of government. Um, which you know was always a very interesting relationship, and uh, one that's worked you know because of cooperation as much as anything else. 
Um, so you have all of the policies that relate to health and to um, uh, community and social services and all of the policies of government had to go through the Ministry of the Attorney General. And then there was the Chief Law Officer of the Crown Duty, which is a constitutional responsibility quite apart from cabinet and government <coughs> where the Attorney General had the responsibility to ensure that government acted in accordance with law and debating when you might have to call on that. And um, so, so all in all, hugely operationally challenging, mm -hmm. um, running all the courts and many of the other uh, you know, equity-related or justice uh, tribunals. So huge operational challenges, wonderful public policy issues, great legal issues, working with amazing people. I mean, the lawyers are all just so committed. As Rhea knows, <laughs> as Rhea is a, a great example, and uh, so really great job. Rhea, we, you told us up to the point where you did, uh, let's see, your, your ADR work, and um, we know that you are in, uh, dealing with Aboriginal issues. Maybe you can pull back it together. Forward. I'm back going and to forward. I'm going to try to link the broader discussion to a point uh, Andromic you made about something public public law fitting in with uh, yes, Greek uh, heritage and culture. I'll use that as my uh, pivoting point. Um, at home, as we were uh, growing up, and when I say we, I have a sister, and, and we didn't, unlike Gina's small C community, we didn't have any other relatives in, in, in Canada. So it was very much the four of us, my parents and uh, the, the two kids. But we had a lot of discussions, age appropriate, around history and uh, politics and politics in Canada and politics in, uh, in Greece. And my mom insisted from a fairly young age that we get acquainted with the newspaper and be, be aware of our community, where we belong, where we fit in as Canadian children of Greek background. And something that was, um, I credit my parents, um, something that was conveyed to us, it wasn't um, a narrow version, you know, you're Greek and you're proud, and um, it wasn't that sort of thing. It, they were very sensitive to the fact that um, they'd started their family in Canada, that we were going to remain in Canada, and as citizens, as Canadian, hyphenated Canadians, if you wish, we had a hybrid identity. And so they were always trying to balance those two, not to shortchange, one for the other, but really to draw out those qualities. Um, and I, 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 spent, I focused on that because when it came to them deciding what to do, again, they wanted us to uh, have a professional, some, uh, an education that would lead to professional career. And I still remember my, my dad's horror when I came in undergrad and said, I'm taking an art history course as you know, one of the electives at McGill, my, my undergrad was in political theory, philosophy, and, uh, but you took some complementary courses and uh, there was for an instant this art history, that's not gonna take you anywhere. Uh, so there was a <laughs> sense that um, it had to be a professional career, but it stopped there, that we were free to choose what uh, we wanted to do. So when you grow out of an environment where the subjects are you know, history, politics, current events, where you fit, where do you fit in? Law was, uh, and, and if you're not good in math, um, law was a very good place to, uh, to, to start with. And uh, public law. And public law um, is the further, uh, further extension. Now, I fell into Aboriginal law quite by accident because a friend of mine in law school said, there's a lawyer who wants a summer student in Montreal. Are you spending time in Montreal? But he practices in a strange area you may or may not be interested. And again, that sense of public service, public interest, current events, and in 1990, you know, OCA hadn't happened yet, so it, you know, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't necessarily the most attractive practice area to go into, but I thought, you know, I'm gonna try it. What do, it's a summer, What's, what can happen? Did I know in March that in June we'd have the, the Oka crisis and I'd be on the other side of the barricades? Mm -hmm. No, I didn't. Um, 
And then it was starting to, I went through a phase, do I stay with Aboriginal law or do I expand my skills? And a struggle that went through my mind again was, who am I, what's my identity, can I represent these communities, will, it, will I do a good job, do I understand them, do I connect with them? And so I took a pause and built uh, skills in private practice. Uh, Gina actually introduced me to so does Carvana, so it, we're quite, <laughs> the, the connections are quite uh, uh, interesting. I spent almost six years there, mm -hmm. but gradually there was that call it an inner voice, call it some pull that um, it, I, 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 you know, if I turned the clock back, I would do it exactly the same way. Um, but it, a position came up at Crown Law Civil at the time when Andromache was acting deputy, and one of my challenges was how will I interview in this building <laughs> without <laughs> blowing things, and I didn't know what, how it would unfold. Um, and I joined I was hired at a time when the only lawyer who was doing Aboriginal law was about mm -hmm. to retire. Mm -hmm. uh, and landed, here I was, uh, 33, 32, 33 years old with an Aboriginal practice. Uh, but again, in, a, in an area that has become a passion. Uh, uh, now that team is about 10, 12 lawyers. I was in uh, private practice for uh, about 14 years, uh, working uh, godless hours pretty much around the clock between community work and that, and uh, uh, trying to go to the theater now and then, and there's never any time to sleep. And the got a lot of stories out of it, some of them quite entertaining, and a, a lot of it was uh, far too much, even in retrospect, I'd, be I'd wanna go to the theater for the opera and rush home. <coughs> I would go into the passenger seat, my wife would give me a plate of food and would drive downtown to the theater, put the plate under the seat and I'd go to the theater and quite frequently fall asleep. <laughs> <coughs> so uh, uh, between I said, uh, working around the clock and community affairs is after 14 years I started to burn out and I gave it up and my way out was my, my brother. Uh, who couldn't finish high school, but he could certainly run a business. He had a very successful uh, vegetable processing company, and, um, and all of you have tasted our vegetables. What is the name of your company? The, the company is called Pride Pack, but anybody who's walked into a McDonald's has had one of our salads. <laughs> 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 and if not, you've taken your kids there for a Big Mac, every bit of vegetable. But in any event, that gave me freed up my time to go to the theater more often. So for the last quite a few years, I have become a very, very regular theater and opera critic. <laughs> uh, I go to the theater at least twice a week. It goes about 130, 140 times a year. Uh, and you know, you spend until one, two in the morning uh, writing the review right after you've seen the play or the opera. Uh, and some magazine writing, some book reviews, and some uh, general uh, articles. Uh, so that between that and community affairs belonging to uh, usually two or three organizations uh, and showing up at the office, oh, nice to see you again. But it's when you're in-house, you don't have to worry about billable hours. Productivity doesn't depend on me. There are clearly some issues that I have to babysit and follow through, uh, but there is uh, life uh, after <laughs> private <laughs> practice. <laughs> and uh, uh, said for, for, for me at least, the theater and the opera are a great outlet uh, and community affairs provide some fun, but uh, you need a pretty thick skin and people of Jim Bovitsa generation don't have it. That's why they belong to HCLA and not to the Greek community. <laughs> Constance. Pleasure. Oh, no problem. I always look forward to it. Okay. Um, we do pay our dues every year, Jim. <laughs> 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 um, I'm uh, like Jim. I'm a non-practicing lawyer. 
And um, what's, I guess, interesting in, in my personal upbringing was my parents always encouraged us to go to school and, again, get an education and do that, quote, right thing. Um, but growing up in my family, my parents were always working. I think it was just a sign of the times. Immigrants get ahead, two, three jobs. So my, my brother and I, my brother's older than me, um, in essence, we were, <coughs> I found raising ourselves. So what, on the one hand, the family was growing, we were united and strong, but on the other hand, the parents weren't always around to kind of provide, if you will, that, that support. So we went off, we pursued our education, we um, both got our uh, designations, my brother's an accountant, and um, I became a lawyer. But I realized quickly um, the business of law and the importance that despite my passion of helping people in legal aid and thinking law was something that I thought it was, I realized quickly that um, that's not the case. There was tremendous expectations at an early age, e even a, as an articling student. I was only as good as my last month, frankly. And I, I just, I think I lost my zest early on in planning for a family. Um, I mentioned I do have three young children right now. I drive my kids to school every day. I pick them up on most days. Um, family, I think that's the epitome. My, you know, my son plays rep hockey, and I mentioned this journey. Five, six days a week, I'm in the ring. My daughter dances, swims, so I'm... Glad those <laughs> days are over. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> doing non... Uh, legal things, if you will, right. allows me to spend that more quality mm -hmm. time, if you will, mm -hmm. with my children, which for me and like all parents is very important. I'm not going to miss my kid's hockey game or my daughter's dance class because I'm, quote, working. And I was a personal choice that I made along with my wife and, you know, unequivocal support. And um, presently, we, uh, we, we have a family business. I do some, some finance and some real estate and various other things that allows the, the quality of life. But frankly, I still have a passion for law. I'm still up to date with the law. I read the Ontario reports every week, and um, I'm certainly a big member of the HCLA and a loyalist. And um, groups such as this uh, just further encourage me to really get into, uh, stay committed to the law, if you will. So although I'm not a, quote, practicing lawyer, my l my I think my heart certainly is in, in the law, and I'm very passionate about that, and seeing other Greek lawyers succeed. and. Um, in a nutshell, uh, that that's my story. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sophia. <laughs> I wish I could say I had some coherent vision of my path, and there isn't one whatsoever. I don't think anybody does. The rest of us. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. No coherent exactly. path no. whatsoever. Um, it, same as everybody else, education was the big deal. And um, my, my mother was the true. My mother was one of those people who was phenomenally well-read, fluent in three languages, but she was, although born in Montreal, she spent her formative years in Athens and was in Greece during the Second World War. So she was in Athens from 1925 to 1946, and so just at the point that she would have probably gone to university, she couldn't. Mm -hmm. So it was that much more of a big deal for her. My dad was passionate about us being educated, and it, there was never any issue that because we were women, we wouldn't go to school. Oh it, no. was no. it was never. It was always just you go to school. I mean, that's what you do, mm -hmm. right? And and um, but my mother was the real behind it all. Oh. She really was. I mean, it was just school was incredibly important from that high, and there was never any doubt in my mind that both of us would not just go to undergraduate, but keep going into whatever. My sister's a PhD. You know, there was no doubt. So nobody ever said law to me. I think for me it was more that I was coming of age at a point when women were starting to do different things. I didn't want to do teaching. I didn't want to do nursing because I was lousy in math. So it was for me it was a choice to choose something different. But my undergraduate was in history, and probably I should have stayed in history because <laughs> there's my real passion in life is writing and researching and doing history. So for me, I was very fortunate. I fell into a practice area with a particular set of people. So whatever they would have been practicing, that probably was where I would have ended up. As it turned out, it was a family law firm, um, and I was very fortunate. They were amazing women, Harriet Sachs and Lynn King. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were phenomenal mentors. But 
Uh, and then when Lynn was appointed to the bench, Harriet and I joined five other women. So we had probably the first female, all-female law firm in, in Toronto, possibly in the country, but we're not sure. They're about, we're about to do a, a firm history, which brings me back to the <laughs> what I love. <laughs> but um, I think what for me, I stayed in law longer than I, in practice, longer than I would have because they were such wonderful people to work with. Mm. It was like golden hand cuffs, you know, you just didn't want it. But when I, w I finally reached a point where I thought I, I don't want that confrontation is not mm. for me. I, and I think if I think back on my family existence, it was such a coherent whole that it, y it used to still, I'd sit there listening to horrible, <coughs> sad stories about divorce and think, oh my God, you know, where the people's lives are, where family was so important to us and people were struggling with that. So I reached a point where I left and it, I came here and I've had three different jobs at the Law Society and the policy job that I've been in now for 14 years allows me to write, which I love to do, and in some ways tell stories, which is the other side of what we mm -hmm. do because we're drawing stories for our benchers as they develop policy. And so it, it's worked out to be the right mix. And through this committee, I've actually gotten a chance to do some writing as well on some history subjects. So, but you know, where it all flows from or goes to, who knows? <laughs> who knows? <laughs> Sounds like life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, mm -hmm. that is wonderful. So let me see. We have community with a big C and community with a little C and education. Mm -hmm. Sense of history, entrepreneurship, public law. <laughs> yes, <laughs> law. <laughs> and and we are out of time. <laughs> so I would like to thank you very much for a, a really fascinating and informative uh, afternoon. And I'd like to just make a final pitch. If you have any anything. photographs, yes, documents, please. pieces of thank paper, you. anything. That is going to sit in a box somewhere and rot. Donate it to the archives because the, one of the things that we have been trying to do is we don't have our history. We don't have pieces of paper from this profession. And at each generation, we lose it because as people die, literally die, we'll never get a chance to see it. So some of the older professionals, we got photographs of what their offices looked like which was in and of itself, you don't think it's important, but it's incredibly important. So whatever you've got there, go home and look for it. You may not think it's important, but we'd love to have it. A photograph of some event that you were given something at that shows your office, that shows you in your setting, that shows you on the bench, give it to us because we will love it and we will make sure that it's accessible to researchers forevermore. And because maybe I put it on the website too yeah. for everybody. I yeah. just did a I just did some work on the Reading Law Club, which was a, a, a club of Jewish lawyers that formed in nineteen forty seven because they were excluded from the Toronto Lawyers Club. The Toronto Lawyers Club would not allow anybody who wasn't white, Christian, and under age forty and male to be members. And so J Toronto the Toronto's Jewish lawyers formed the Reading Law Club. And by sheer luck, we've managed to find some of the people who were very actively involved in the club. And one of them, by some miracle, actually had held on to some of the documentation. And mm -hmm. from that, we've been able to create their history and put it in writing so that it's accessible. And these are the kinds of stories that we need to tell because <coughs> they tell something to the new groups that are trying to make a place for themselves in this profession. So mm -hmm. they didn't think, I mean, Donald Carr, bless him, had it in a box somewhere, and it was only when we went along and said, give them to us, and they're now in our archives. Mm -hmm. And they'll be there protected so that somebody else can come along and use them. So if you've got anything, even if you don't think it's important, and you haven't already given it to these guys over here, give it to us, <laughs> okay? Thank you, and a good reminder. Thank, thank you. you. It's yeah, very, thank you very, very much. Much. Very enjoyable. Thank very you. Thank you. And thank very you, skillfully <laughs> done. <laughs> I know how hard it is to.